Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar organized by the British Association of Comparative Law, BACL, as we are known. I am the chair of BACL, and I would first like to express our thanks to the Society of Legal Scholars uh, for having us joining the SLS conference this year again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Intercentia Publishing, uh, for uh, providing us with a very generous 25% uh, discount online for online purchases made this month. You just need to enter the code, which will be put in the online chat. Our chair today is Professor Titi Arvind. Arvind is currently head of the York Law School, and he's also one of 13 investigators in a large interdisciplinary project between five UK universities, which aims to improve the socio-technical resilience and trustworthiness of autonomous systems. Arvind, we are very grateful for your making the time to chair this webinar, and I hand over to you now to introduce our topic and our wonderful speakers. Over to you then. Thank you all. We have a fantastic panel today uh, to discuss a really interesting and important topic. We've seen over recent years how artificial agents, autonomous systems of various types have been increasingly getting involved in everyday existence, whether it's determining the ads we see on Facebook, whether it's determining uh, uh, making decisions in relation to fundamental aspects of what we can and cannot do, uh, decisions in relation to governmental systems. We see autonomous systems, artificial agents in use everywhere, permeating our everyday lives. A lot of the work around us tends to be done uh, in the realm of technocratic regulation. But as private lawyers know, you cannot get away from private law and you cannot get away from the fundamentally important role of the law of tort or the law of delict, the law of civil liability. And this panel, organized by Bacal, comes together to look at comparative tort law and comparative approaches to the question of civil liability. This question of profound importance now. There is a sense in which we spend more time in our national jurisdictions talking to people from other disciplines than having the sort of cross-jurisdictional dialogue between common law and civil law, between different legal systems. That is absolutely foundational to this area and that we need to have if we are going to get our approach to this area right. Uh, the panel we have today consists of three speakers, all three very well known to anyone who does any work in this field, and we're very, very lucky and fortunate that they've agreed to speak today. The format we'll be following today is that we will begin with a brief presentation from each speaker, up to about 15 minutes per speaker. We will go through all three speakers, after which there will be time for questions and answers. This being a Zoom webinar, the questions and answers will take the form of the questions typed into the question and answers section of Zoom. If you look down to the bottom of your screen, you should see a question and answers, a Q&A button. If you type your question into that, we will pick it up in the question and answer session at the end. We'll be grouping questions together, so and depending on how many there are, we may not be able to get to all of them, but we will try and get as many questions from as many people um, as possible. As chair, I'm conscious that I can end up waxing eloquent about the importance of the topic for far too long, so I will stop talking about that now and just briefly introduce the three panelists we have today before I hand over to them. Our first speaker and the first panelist today is Professor Bernard Koch of the University of Innsbruck. I think all tort lawyers with, who are comparatively minded will be extremely familiar uh, with his work. Professor Koch is Professor of Civil Law at the um, University of Innsbruck. His, he has done an immense amount of work on various forms of liability in tort law and more recently on the, on the manner in which tort law hopes with technological advances, ranging from genetic modification to autonomous agents. And we are, I think, very fortunate to have him with us today, and we very much look forward to hearing his thoughts on the topic. 
Our second speaker is Professor Ugo Pagalo. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Pagalo, of course, is again well known to us for his work on, on uh, robotics, technology and tort law. He is professor at the University of Turin. He is also vice president of the Italian Association of Legal Informatics. Um, he again has an enormous amount of work in this, including 11 monographs, including some of the foundational works in artificial intelligence and court law. And once again, I think we're very lucky to have him today and we look forward to his talk. Our third speaker is Professor Simon Chesterman, who is Dean of the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore. Um, <clears throat> Professor Chesterman has done fantastic work in the area of international law, public authority, global governance, and artificial intelligence and big data. Uh, Professor Chesterman's work on artificial intelligence in the context of robots and the limits on the law, again, is one of the foundational texts in the field. And we once again very are very fortunate to have him and look forward to hearing his, uh, his thought on the topic. So without further ado, I'd now like to invite Professor Bernard Koch to present his, uh, to, to kick off our discussions today by talking about tort law, and damage caused by AI systems. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your very kind introduction. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Um, so um, when preparing this session, we agreed that I should start out with a quick run through the challenges that AI poses to tort law as it is. I will therefore briefly remind you of some of the key features of the current laws of delict in Europe. The limitation to this continent is due to the fact that Ernst Kammer and myself were asked to produce a study for the European Union Commission with roughly that same task and Mark Geistfeld added the US perspective. For purposes of this brief talk, I will use autonomous cars as the sample AI system. One, because it is the most likely large scale AI technology that we may see on the market, at least in the nearer future. And two, because it is helpful to illustrate the range of issues we need to consider today. So let's start off with tort laws at present, which currently obviously only have to deal with accidents involving conventional vehicles. After all, despite an increasing number of assistance systems, most cars on public roads today would not yet reach a high level on the scale of automation envisaged for the future. So let's take a standard car accident injuring a victim. Historically, the primary response of all legal systems would be and still is fault liability of the driver if the victim manages to prove flawed conduct on his behalf that caused her harm. The driver's liability uh, may be reduced or even excluded due to the contributory conduct of the victim herself, who may not be a pedestrian, but uh, the driver of another car with which the first one collided. Then there may be further additional extra, <clears throat> external causes that may impact upon the outcome of the tort law analysis. In order to simplify the following, let's ignore those for the time being, however. Some legal systems have long introduced an alternative route towards indemnifying the victim, focusing no longer on some misconduct of the driver, but instead on the risk attached to the car involved in traffic. These jurisdictions therefore grant a claim for compensation against the keeper or whatever person is identified as the addressee of such claims. Inspired by US case law going all the way back to the early 20th century in the US, alternatively, the victim may also sue the producer of the car, but only if she can prove that it was defective, i.e. did not meet the standard of safety reasonably to be expected. This started with fault-based and in some jurisdictions, even contractual liability theories. But after the 1985 Products Liability Directive, a strict liability concept was introduced throughout the EC, even though its success in approximating the member states' laws may be questioned. Either way, this regime also allows direct claims against producers of mere components of the final car if those were flawed and made it defective in a way ultimately causing harm. In today's modern times, we are not only looking at hardware parts, but also at digital components, but whether those who develop them are subject to strict product liability is currently under debate, 
and I will get back to that. Let's also ignore those for the time being, therefore. So we're looking at a range of possible claims available to the victim based on various causes of action. If we look at Europe, we can find all three possible causes of action, though with variations. The biggest differences can be found when looking at strict liability, not only when it comes to traffic accidents. These differences affect various aspects of the potential claims based on risk rather than misconduct. First of all, the addressee of the claim is not always the keeper of the object to which liability attaches. More significant, however, are the differences relating to the range and scope of strict liability. Most jurisdictions foresee individual causes of action in separate statutes or at least otherwise by individual statutory provision. Some countries, either alongside such singular instances or instead, have introduced general clauses of liability irrespective of fault, typically attached to dangerous objects and or substances. And then there is, of course, France with its responsibility de fait des choses, which a few countries have taken over. Only Austrian courts, to my knowledge, allow the application of its singular instances of liability by way of analogy, which at least to some extent compensate the lack of a general clause in my country. Defenses foreseen in those statutory liability regimes differ quite significantly. Just think of the almost non-relevance of contributory conduct of the victim under the French law by Denter, as opposed to the full recognition of comparative fault in most other countries. The extent of compensation is not only sometimes limited by caps, whose amounts differ throughout Europe despite harmonized liability insurance regimes. Even the heads of damage are not the same in otherwise corresponding strict liability regimes. Whether or not victims can alternatively or cumulatively sue on a fault theory alongside their claim under the strict liability regime is also not answered identically throughout Europe. So even without new technologies, the current tort laws in Europe are quite diverse, to put it mildly. This colorful landscape obviously also applies to damage caused by AI systems. However, we need to add a few more players to the scenario with which we started. Autonomous cars will need additional input in order to function properly, and this will typically be provided over the air. This connectedness comes with additional risks, not only from hackers. If we talk about autonomous cars, we can no longer ignore the contributors of digital content to the vehicles, starting with the AI core itself, obviously. Now let's run through the list of possible bases of tort claims again, starting with vault-based liability. The obvious big difference is that there will typically no longer be a driver, but rather a mere user of the car who is hardly anything more than a passenger. So it will be difficult to find some fault in the latter's conduct which may have triggered the accident, although there are, of course, some exceptional scenarios we can imagine. The hacker will act with intent, at least with Rolos eventualis, but obviously it will be difficult to identify him, let alone successfully collect compensation, even if brought to court. So we need to ignore the obvious faulty party here and move on to other potential addressees of fault-based claims who may have failed to install updates like the keeper, or something flawed in the sphere of the manufacturer. However, even if the rules on vicarious liability would allow the victim to sue the employer of someone within the sphere of the manufacturer, for example, the victim still needs to prove that someone did something wrong, and that will be a rather challenging hurdle on the path towards compensation. Strict liability does not require proof of wrongdoing, so this seems to be a more promising path for our victim. However, while this will work in those countries which already now foresee strict liability for traffic accidents, it will not in those which don't. Even in the former group, there are considerable differences between the national regimes as indicated earlier, even though they will invariably kick in. After all, liability in all these countries is linked to the use of a vehicle in traffic and does not require a driver behind the steering wheel. Strict product liability is harmonized and even non-EU countries have followed the model of the PLD. However, it is highly disputed whether software and digital content are products falling under the current directives regime and the majority denies that. This becomes an even bigger problem if we have no hardware steered by AI, but a standalone AI system such as a healthcare app providing diagnosis, for example. As a glimmer of hope, 
We can safely assume, however, that even under the current PLD regime, victims of autonomous cars will be able to sue its manufacturer as long as they can prove that the vehicle was defective without the need to identify that it was a hardware component that was flawed. Most agree already now that a defect is in the meaning of Article 6 of the directive can also be caused by software, including AI, as long as the defective item affected is a tangible thing, such as a car in our example. A novel approach towards liability, so a fourth part, if you will, was proposed inter alia by the European Parliament in its 2017 resolution, even though they have meanwhile officially withdrawn that idea expressly. Five years ago, though, they called on the Commission to consider, I quote, creating a specific legal status for robots so that these could be established as having the status of electronic persons responsible for making good any damage they may cause, end of quote. I guess Hugo will talk more about this later, but let's say for the time being that this idea comes with some flaws, to put it mildly. Most importantly, this would require that a car would need its own assets in order to collect on any personal liability it may thereby have. This is effectively a way to curtail the extent of compensation for the victim, however, and it is obvious that such a regime would invariably bring along lawsuits trying to pierce the electronic veil, so to say. In the expert group, we decided that legal personality for AI systems is not necessary from a total perspective, but acknowledged that if there already is legal personality for other reasons, it obviously would need to come along with full responsibility, including delictual liability. As you could see, there are no gaps in the law as it stands. All legal systems already now foresee systems of liability which kick in if an AI system causes harm, most importantly, fault liability. However, these existing regimes may not always lead to a desirable outcome, i.e. leave victims of harm caused by AI systems empty-handed, even though it would seem fair to provide them with compensation. While those countries which already now have strict liability regimes in place will easily apply those as well to AI systems, as long as they fall within the definition of the risks covered, we need to be aware of the considerable differences between the existing European legal strict liability regimes. When it comes to product liability, it is clear that the 1985 directive no longer provides a satisfactory answer to the challenges of modern day technology, but hope is on the way. As you know, the commission intends to amend the directive and the draft should be published any day now. Um, according to rumors, it may be published uh, on the 28th of September, which is the date when the Commission will also publish a draft on AI liability, so a second uh, draft instrument on the topic of today. Uh, but I'll leave it at this and thank you for the time being. Thank you very much for that fascinating talk and uh, also for the <laughs> excellent timekeeping, which is, keeps us spot on target. Um, we'll save questions for the end, as I said initially. I'd now like to invite Professor Pagallo uh, to uh, to speak to us about the challenges facing tort law and the different ways of regulating AI-related systems. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, Alice, not personally in London, but maybe next year. As you can see, there has been a lot of debate and uh, normative activism as regards uh, the legal challenges of uh, data-driven technologies and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, there are several ways in which uh, we may interpret uh, what's going on at the EU level. Uh, as you can see, there are almost a dozen regulation plus uh, the two former uh, proposals that the commission will be presented by the end of this month. And so uh, what's happening at least uh, at uh, the uh, EU law level? Uh, well, uh, I think that the reason uh, for all this uh, tsunami of legal initiatives at the European level uh, concern what's unique uh, to the bench of uh, technologies uh, under scrutiny. And uh, I'll try to illustrate this point uh, in terms of uh, uh, so-called third order technologies. 
uh, enhance uh, what's unique to the legal challenges brought forth by uh, AI and generally speaking, uh, data-driven uh, technologies. Uh, such challenges, this is the, uh, to me a crucial point, may regard either misuses and overuses of uh, technology, of artificial intelligence, uh, or underuses of artificial uh, intelligence, uh, that is uh, uh, not using AI for the wrong reasons. Three years ago in the, uh, 2019, uh, the, uh, in a press release, the European Parliament referred to this uh, hypothesis of AI underuse as a major threat. And there are several wrong reasons why we may not use uh, AI systems uh, from uh, medicine and healthcare to agriculture, uh, to non-discrimination societies and so forth. Uh, among uh, these wrong reasons, I may uh, recall you public distrust, especially in the era of uh, non-vaccine conspiracy theories, or lack of in infrastructures, or of incentives, uh, bureaucracy, so on and so forth. So in uh, this slide, you uh, can see that some initiatives uh, of the uh, EU institutions uh, directly deal uh, with and aim to tackle uh, possible cases of AI underuse. For example, uh, the uh, Data Governance Act. Of course, on the other hand, uh, we shouldn't forget cases in which uh, AI is misused and uh, even uh, overused. Uh, um, and uh, I may, uh, the first uh, uh, proposal, the uh, so-called Artificial Intelligence Act is the first in the list. And this is another uh, example uh, of the uh, EU institutions uh, aiming to tackle possible misuses and overuses uh, of uh, uh, technology. And here now I will uh, focus on uh, this uh, last scenario. That is uh, um, how to tackle uh, possible misuses and overuses uh, of technology from the viewpoint of uh, uh, tort law and distinguishing between uh, uh, short-term and uh, mid-term challenges. Of course, I will not talk about long-term challenges because apparently we are going to be all dead in the long uh, run. Uh, so how about the sh short term? Uh, in October, 2020, uh, the European Parliament released its uh, report uh, on uh, civil liability uh, regime for artificial intelligence. And the overall claim was uh, that uh, there is no need for a complete revision of uh, today's liability uh, regimes. Uh, however, in uh, November 2019, uh, the uh, high-level expert group set up by the European Commission in order to analyze uh, the normative challenges of AI, especially considering uh, tortious liability. Bernhard, uh, Bernhard was a member of that group. Uh, I had the pleasure and honor to be a member as well. Well, uh, this group released a report in November uh, 2019, uh, stressing how uh, such liability uh, regimes can and should be uh, ameliorated to uh, tackle compensation uh, gaps uh, triggered by uh, misuses and overuses of artificial intelligence. And in that report, uh, we stressed uh, several strategies in order to uh, tackle the shortcomings of uh, the law. Uh, and the first strategy uh, regards the extension of current uh, liability regimes. Uh, for example, uh, duties of care, procedural standards uh, on burdens of proofs and presumptions, uh, theories of agency, and the like. Uh, as an instance, uh, the high level expert group suggested the reversal of the burden of proof for uh, several cases. Uh, for example, dealing with uh, difficulties and costs for determining the safety of the AI system or for determining uh, the standard of care or when the victim has no access uh, to the relevant information, so on and so forth. Uh, 
However, the extension of existing doctrines in tort law may not uh, be good enough. Uh, cases of hacking, uh, Bernhard was referring to this specific uh, hypothesis considering uh, self-driving cars, illustrate uh, how tort law rules can be insufficient to defend victims of uh, cyber attacks. Uh, after all, as Bernhard stressed, it can be impossible for the victim of a cyber attack to identify a human uh, perpetrator. So that uh, scholars uh, have recommended to complement rule and principles of tort law with a further mechanism of a legal protection. Um, going back uh, to the report of the high level expert group, uh, and that was the case when we suggested the adoption of uh, uh, compensation uh, schemes. Uh, however, in the midterm, should uh, we be ready for more radical solutions than uh, the extension of exist, uh, existing uh, doctrines in tort law or the adoption of further schemes uh, like uh, compensation schemes? Uh, well, uh, as Bernhard uh, stressed uh, four years ago in 2018, the European Parliament uh, released a document in which uh, uh, the EU institution uh, explicitly referred to uh, the possibility of adopt a new sort of electronic uh, personhood for some uh, AI systems. Uh, sorry, Bernhard, I uh, don't aim to discuss uh, here, and sorry, Simon, of course, uh, this uh, specific topic, but uh, here I want to focus on that which has suggested such radical midterm solution for the accountability uh, gaps of uh, AI. Uh, and in fact, the reason why we have uh, several problems uh, concerning uh, how to deal with AI systems, uh, either concerning their misuses or uh, even their uh, overuses. Uh, well, uh, such accountability gaps of AI go hand in hand with the functioning of a complex digital uh, ecosystems. And what's important here to stress is that uh, when we are dealing with uh, uh, AI systems, uh, with the Internet of Things, uh, self-driving cars, uh, you name it, we have to distinguish three orders of technology. A first order technology is uh, the simplest uh, one, namely a technology as a simple tool. A second order technology is when we are, uh, when we are using a technology uh, for another technology. Uh, Think, uh, for example, about the uh, screw and the screwdrivers. Uh, but here we are dealing with third order technologies, namely technologies which interact with other technologies within an environment defined and determined by other technologies. Uh, Typical uh, and common examples of uh, uh, third order technologies environment uh, given by barcodes, high frequency trading systems, the internet of things and the like. <clears throat> Why these uh, third order uh, future of the technologies we are dealing with is so important? <clears throat> Well, in a nutshell, because when we are dealing with uh, third order technologies, uh, humans are no longer needed in the loop. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, the game uh, changer. Of course, uh, uh, institutions, scholars, uh, civil society may pretend that uh, we have to have a meaningful human control over the whole functioning of uh, third order technologies. Uh, and this is, as you know, uh, a very important debate in many fields. Uh, for example, that's what uh, uh, governmental experts are discussing over the past five years in Switzerland about how to amend the laws of war. Another uh, typical example of how third order technologies uh, are uh, triggering a new generation of legal issues. In addition, 
we have to uh, consider the cases of uh, distributed responsibility. Uh, what do I mean? Well, the fact that in many cases, every single individual action per se is uh, neither illegal nor immoral, but when you put together, when you aggregate all these uh, individual interactions, the final outcome can be really problematic. Traditional examples given by, for example, uh, environmental law. Or in many cases, dealing with uh, third order technologies, uh, we are facing intricate legal chains of uh, cause and effects uh, and can be really tricky, if not impossible, to pick up the single uh, element of that chain that should be considered as uh, accountable for the final outcome of uh, human AI interaction. These scenarios uh, have suggested some radical uh, solutions. Uh, Berhard mentioned uh, the idea of the European Parliament about a new electronic personhood for some kinds of AI robots. Some colleagues uh, recorded that this is already possible in corporate law. Uh, for example, in Delaware, of course, in Delaware, everything is legally possible, but uh, it's very interesting that to examine the very possibility of a new status for some AI systems. Uh, by the way, this week it was announced a couple of days ago that we have the first robotic CEO uh, in China. Uh, uh, I don't read the Chinese, so I couldn't check uh, the, uh, directly the source of this information. Uh, I, I think it was published a couple of days ago. Uh, in any event, all these scenarios have also recommended uh, forms of uh, legal experimentation. Uh, from uh, the uh, Japanese uh, Toku, special zones created by the Japanese government in order to test the human robot interaction and to understand how to legally address the challenges of this interaction since the early uh, 2000s, so that uh, they have almost 20 years of legal experimentation in this field. Uh, but uh, EU institutions followed suit with uh, uh, the sandboxes of the Artificial Intelligence Act. These forms of legal exper experimentation reminds us of how uh, to prevent not only misuses and overuses of technology, but also uh, the threat of AI under use as stressed by the European Parliament uh, three years ago. So, uh, in light of my uh, single unique slide, as you can see, uh, at least in uh, EU law, there is a, a lot of debate following the political activism of the EU institutions uh, in this field. Tort law and uh, tortious liability represent, uh, of course, a crucial field uh, in order to understand how legal systems uh, are aiming to govern uh, advancements uh, of uh, technology. And in particular, I uh, distinguished between short, short uh, term uh, attempts to, to uh, address these uh, challenges and mid-term solutions, uh, including some radical solutions such as a new legal status for our AI systems. And, uh, I hope uh, I respect the time uh, I was given and uh, that's uh, all for a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I mean, I, once again, fantastic timekeeping and very, very thought provoking uh, points. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussion once we're done. Could I now ask Professor Chesterman to uh, speak? Professor Chesterman will be broadening the comparative perspective by drawing on the experience of uh, jurisdictions outside the EU and looking at how policy objectives and factors operate there, particularly the question of when, how, and why to regulate. Thanks very much. And it's a great pleasure to be taking part in this discussion to uh, catch up with Ugo, who I know well, Bernard, whose work I've admired from a distance. Uh, and I think Bernard has done a great job of setting up where tortious liability is now. Ugo, 
mapping out where the European Union has been going, which is kind of everywhere all at the same time at once. Uh, and my job is maybe to pull things back uh, a little bit and bring in some other perspectives, as the uh, chair has said, um, from the angle of sort of what we're trying to achieve uh, and how some other jurisdictions are looking at that. And I say that as an Australian uh, who was educated in England, worked in the United States, has lived in China, but now based in Singapore. So I'm kind of from everywhere. Um, so what I'll try and do is really just tease out, um, you know, I've got a few slides also, um, really starting with the question, well, what is, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, and I'm pleased in this session that um, both Bernard and Hugo are very realistic, um, that there are challenges posed by AI, but they're not insurmountable. And in particular, there's no need to sort of go scrambling for the sort of Asimovian new laws to address all of these issues. The main question is how we adapt, tweak existing laws um, to address the problem. Uh, and I, I think I would be with Bernard, I, not wanting to put words in his mouth, uh, in saying that most AI use cases can be covered by most of our existing laws most of the time. Um, but there are some challenges. Uh, and uh, so high frequency trading algorithms were, were highlighted uh, already. So one problem that AI does pose is speed. Uh, and that even if we're regulating uh, or governing activities by laws uh, that traditionally apply to humans, the speed with which AI systems uh, can uh, conduct activities can pose practical problems, although these are more practical problems than, than legal ones, but the speed of AI is an issue. Um, autonomy, uh, the example that Bernard focused on of autonomous vehicles does raise questions about uh, if there is um, fault uh, and it can't be attributed to a traditional driver, um, then who can it be attributed to? Uh, although again, most of those problems can be solved. Uh, and then we've got the problem of opacity. Uh, this is the problem that in particular over the last dozen or so years with the rise of machine learning techniques, uh, we're having issues in terms of understanding how AI systems make decisions in the first place. Uh, and so to address these, we have different responses. We have the question of, okay, well, who is going to be held responsible? How can we attribute responsibility? Uh, this issue of personality, uh, again, maybe we can defer that to the Q&A if people are interested, um, but I'm I'm pretty reluctant to go down the path of legal personality, uh, if only, uh, well, partly for the reason Bernard highlighted that it would presume a whole series of things uh, that you would need assets, uh, but primarily I'd be wary of personality uh, for AI systems because it would uh, it would shield existing traditional legal persons, either humans or corporations from responsibility. Uh, and so I don't really see a, a great benefit uh, in creating a form of artificial legal personality, although most legal systems certainly could. Um, transparency, we haven't really got into, but transparency uh, is um, arguably going to be one of the key challenges uh, in moderating the risks of AI, uh, because some of the benefits of complex uh, neural networks are that they can process billions and billions of variables, leading to ever more accurate uh, solutions, but at the same time, raising uh, the difficulty level in explaining things beyond the point which uh, a human can understand. Uh, and so if you ask for transparency in some situations, uh, it's possible, but it might come at the cost of accuracy uh, and indeed uh, give up some of the things that AI is meant to offer us in the first place. Uh, so maybe taking a step back, well, why do we regulate in the first place? Uh, and here, I think it is important to point out that um, tort law obviously uh, plays a key role in allocating risk, allocating responsibility, but it also serves a regulatory function. Um, the reason why uh, negligence, why responsibility might be attributed to one party is in that case to ensure that um, uh, loss falls in an appropriate person's uh, hands, uh, but also because it plays a role in shape of future, shaping future conduct. Uh, and so generally when we regulate, uh, and this includes legislation, we regulate for one of two broad reasons, either to address market failures. Uh, and so, uh, for example, if we maintained the rule that a driver, quote unquote driver is responsible uh, when his or her car does something uh, against the law or is involved in a traffic accident, that would be unjust if the driver actually has no responsibility for the vehicle, that would be a market failure. Uh, but also uh, in support of social or other policies. Uh, this is maybe not so applicable to tort law, uh, but one we reason why we regulate AI systems uh, in particular um, to address questions of bias uh, is not only because it's uh, inefficient, even if it were efficient uh, to be biased based on certain individual characteristics, most jurisdictions would say that's not appropriate. So these are some of the reasons why we regulate, uh, but there are also reasons to refrain from regulating. 
Uh, and this is certainly true in small jurisdictions like Singapore, uh, where there is a great wariness of constraining innovation. Uh, and it's been extremely interesting to watch the debates in the European Union, uh, where obviously a different position has been taken, that there are some things that are worth constraining innovation for, uh, in particular, the rights-based type arguments. Uh, while in other jurisdictions, in my neighborhood, for example, in China, at least until recently, uh, there was, uh, was a real wariness of, of any kind of regulation constraining innovation. Um, the fear is, of course, that you might lose your competitive advantage. One example of this is the, the restriction on stem cell research uh, in the United States in 2001, I think it was, uh, which led to uh, other countries saying, well, we will pursue uh, stem cell research. Uh, in the context of AI, this does raise interesting policy dilemmas, what our risk appetite is. Uh, and generally, you've seen sort of three, this is a slight caricature, three broad approaches. Uh, the United States, where you have very much a market-driven approach uh, with Silicon Valley, uh, until recently, um, really having uh, as little to do with government as possible. Uh, as early as I think the early 2000s, Bill Gates, the former head of Microsoft, used to boast that Microsoft didn't even have an office in Washington, D.C., because it wanted nothing except to be left alone by the government. Europe, clearly, you have a, a different approach uh, where you have uh, rights front and center. Uh, and if the, the cost of protecting rights, uh, whether it's the right to respect for a private life uh, or right not to be subject to certain forms of automated processing, if that brings with a cost, uh, then I think many European certainly many European legislators uh, and many people within that jurisdiction or set of jurisdictions would say it's worth it. Uh, until recently, I would have said China's approach was a sovereigntist approach, putting China's sovereignty first uh, and national security first. And we've seen that in areas like data protection with data localization rules in China. Uh, but it's been quite interesting in the last year and a half, we've seen the personal information protection law, we've seen requirements for algorithm transparency to the point where at least in data protection circles, uh, occasionally people are, there's a kind of game you can play where you take text in English and ask which jurisdiction it came from. And some of the recent Chinese laws uh, do actually look quite European in terms of, in terms of algorithmic transparency, for example. Uh, and if people are keen, maybe we can play that in the Q&A later. Related question, related to this um, issue of not unnecessarily constraining innovation, balancing the costs versus the benefits of regulation is when to regulate. Uh, so I won't go through this in detail, but this is the Collingridge Dilemma, uh, which dates to uh, 1980, a book, uh, The Social Control of Technology by David Collingridge, which essentially said that at an early stage of innovation, uh, it's easy to regulate, uh, but because the costs are low, but you don't know what the problems are. Um, the longer you wait, the clearer the potential harms are, um, but the longer you wait, also the costs of regulation go up. Um, maybe the easiest way to describe this is in terms of social media, that if you wanted to limit the power uh, and the behavior of a company like Facebook in 2004, when it was set up, that would have been quite easy. Jump forward to 2022, uh, and the costs of regulating have gone way up. Against this, uh, and I think we've already heard passing reference to environmental law, uh, the precautionary principle is the idea in environmental law that if there is a clear harm, you shouldn't wait until there's scientific certainty to address that. Uh, and environmental lawyers have been saying this about climate change literally for decades, uh, although not necessarily to any great avail. Uh, another term that's sometimes used is, is masterly inactivity. That's, that's a term sometimes used in Singapore where we have the idea of regulatory sandboxes in fintech and other areas. Uh, the idea being that you don't interfere, but you are closely engaged with the entities to be regulated. What about how to regulate? The, here, sometimes uh, the focus really is on supply rather than demand. Uh, and this is where, in my own work, I've tried to distinguish three broad approaches to regulation for slightly different, well, significantly different purposes. Um, often, it's merely the management of risks. Uh, and so in the example that Bernard focused on, uh, autonomous vehicles, I think all we really want from autonomous vehicles is for them to be safe. Uh, you could argue the same of, of medical technology, uh, and therefore tortious liability can play an important role there. Uh, but in some areas, we don't just want things to be safe. We don't just want the machines to behave. Uh, in some areas, I think there's a strong argument that you don't want machines to be making certain decisions at all. Uh, and here I refer to the, uh, the lethal autonomous weapons debate, where I think there's a pretty strong argument that certain decisions should be kept in human hands uh, but it's important to point out this is not because humans will make better decisions than machines, um, but because we want a human to grapple with certain, in particular, morally fraught decisions like life and death battlefield decisions, 
and for a human to be able to be held accountable for those decisions. Um, a third set of um, decisions, what I call process legitimacy, uh, there are certain decisions where it's not just a requirement that a human make it, uh, but that a particular human make it. And I give the example of a judge uh, where the legitimacy of a judge's decision comes not from necessarily his or her being correct or being him or her being brilliant, uh, but rather from the role he or she plays within a, uh, some sort of politically accountable system. So what tools does tort law offer in this context? Um, so we've had passing reference to negligence. I won't go into this because I think Bernard covered it much better than I can. Uh, but there are challenges to applying a traditional negligence lawsuit uh, if, for example, it's not clear that there's an, ad an identifiable owner, operator, or manufacturer. Uh, in some ways, autonomous vehicles is an easy case here. Hugo re referred to uh, the situation where many AI systems will be distributed, uh, and it'll be much harder to, uh, to uh, consolidate liability into one single entity. Uh, occasionally, there are debates about software agents uh, uh, versus legal agents. I think there's a little bit of confusion there sometimes. We, we can talk about that uh, if people are interested. The main problem that I see with uh, the idea of software agents being treated as agents in the, in the law uh, is that it presumes a degree of personality. What I, what I do think we're going to see, and again, Bernard is uh, focused on this, uh, is a shift from responsibility of the operator to responsibility of the manufacturer. When we look at questions of standard of care, this is actually also extremely interesting and complex. Like, what is the standard to which we should hold an AI system? Uh, again, focusing on autonomous vehicles, uh, in 2021, there were 45,000 deaths just in the United States uh, in on the roads, the vast majority due to driver error, uh, and there were six due to autonomous vehicles. Uh, and you have heard about almost all of those six, and you've heard about almost none of the 45,000. Uh, and there is indeed a danger uh, that in some circumstances, we run the risk of holding AI to a higher standard uh, than humans, um, and that that could unnecessarily constrain innovation. So I think how we, um, how we allocate standards of care, how we determine standard of care, and the breach of that standard of care is going to be important. Uh, and causation. Uh, it's possible that um, AI systems, the way they're set up, uh, could lead to challenges to a traditional negligence lawsuit uh, if the consequences of an AI-enabled system is that it um, carries on, uh, causes harm that goes far beyond what might otherwise have been uh, reasonably foreseeable uh, and, and constitutes a new intervening act. Um, so one, one way of addressing this is through product liability. And it is, it is candidly shocking when I realize that it's still not clear, at least until the EU updates its uh, rules, it's not clear in many jurisdictions whether software constitutes a product, which is extraordinary, uh, given the extent to which we depend on software on a daily basis. Um, 11 years ago, Ryan Carlo actually argued um, an alternative view, which was that um, AI developers should be granted immunity, uh, because otherwise the threat of lawsuits in a jurisdiction like the US would unnecessarily constrain innovation. Um, I think the subsequent decade has shown that that was uh, probably not the right approach uh, and luckily was not followed. Um, against this, another um, term that uh, is worth throwing in uh, is the possibility of no-fault no uh, regimes. Uh, and indeed, it's, um, it's perhaps strange that uh, I don't think I've heard the word insurance mentioned up until now in a discussion of tort law. Uh, and as uh, someone who studied torts as a first-year law student exactly 30 years ago, I was always surprised that we couldn't have an open conversation about the role of insurers. Uh, the reason, of course, being that the fiction in many tortious actions uh, is that it's one party suing another. Uh, but I remember as a law student, as an undergraduate, uh, being kind of befuddled by the wrongful life lawsuits where an, an infant or a child is suing his or her mother uh, for the very fact of being brought into existence. And none of that made sense without the background knowledge that actually this was a way of unlocking access to an insurance policy. So if you're very interested, this is uh, my shameless uh, plug uh, for a book that I did, uh, but uh, really looking forward to the Q&A and, uh, and trying to uh, participate in this rich discussion. But great to be at Backle, although like Hugo, a bit disappointed we didn't get to fly to London for it. Maybe next time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, to all three speakers for a very, very fascinating set of observations. Um, it's going to be very, very hard for me to avoid the temptation to abuse chair's privilege and spend the remaining half an hour bombarding them with questions about the many things they've said. I'm going to, with some, with some difficulty, hold back from that. I think some of the key themes that emerged 
we're looking at with the challenge of when to regulate, why to regulate, how to regulate the diversity of tools available. And we saw that particularly in the deep dive we took as to the European Union's approaches to regulation uh, and the diversity of contexts as well in which the need to regulate arises and some of the problems inherent in balancing all of it. Like I said, I'm full of questions to ask, but I'm going to step back from that and throw the discussion open uh, to uh, to to all to everyone present. Uh, there have been a couple of questions that have come through in chat. One of them has already been answered. Uh, but let me start with one of the other ones. So we have a question from Juan Diaz Granados, who asks, what are the main drawbacks of strict liability to address AI liability allocation? I think I'll just throw that open to the panel. Could we now zoom out so we can see the entire panel and not just me? Well, if, if I may start, um, the, um, there are a couple of issues here. I mean, first of all, um, and that's one issue that I always kept nagging in our expert group discussions, um, is the question of equality. Um, because uh, why are AI victims more equal than others? Um, and strict liability obviously allows a faster and easier path towards compensation, which per se, obviously, nothing wrong about this. but. Then again, you have to ask the question, why is someone injured, let's say, by an autonomous lawnmower um, more worthy of protection than someone hit by a regular lawnmower, just to use that uh, example. Um, so that's one question. Unless you shift the entire system of compensation to a no-fault idea, um, that is a very big question you need to answer beforehand. Now, obviously, there are uh, instances of strict liability in existing legal regimes, and I've alluded to that during my presentation. Um, and uh, the trend at the moment is at least that um, comparable risks that are now dealt with on a strict liability basis should also be dealt with on a strict liability basis if the source of harm is a risk uh, triggered by AI. Uh, and that obviously makes perfect sense. Um, there is also, for example, um, and this already alludes to another question in the chat, um, the, the debate whether uh, or where to place the risk of autonomous cars um, and the uh, Council of Bureaus, for example, which, as you know, handles the green card system, doesn't even have a panel or other commission on AI cars because they argue, well, it's just traffic accidents uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's a, a, a person-driven car or an AI-driven car. Um, it's a traffic accident and we'll deal with it as such. Um, and so um, that use case number one is actually not really a big um, uh, a big um, uh, trigger for an earthquake in liability law, let's put it mildly. Um, actually, there is no reason to legislate, um, at least in those jurisdictions where you have strict liability. There is, however, from a European perspective, a problem with harmonization. And that's the final point I'm going to make, going to make in this regard. Uh, strict liability uh, is, of course, a nice buzzword. But as I think I tried to, to highlight during my presentation, strict liability doesn't mean the same thing in all countries. And actually, even strict liability for cars in those countries which have it is very diverse, um, including harm to the driver, excluding harm to the driver, including harm to the passengers, excluding harm to the passengers, and so forth. Um, collisions, yes or no, uh, or just um, uh, hitting a tree, for example. So there, there's a wide issue of, of harmonization in that respect. And then the question is, if you start harmonizing strict liability for AI systems, um, what is then the next step? Do you just harmonize like strict liability for autonomous vehicles, for example? Or do you have to take the next step and expand that to traditional vehicles? So the question of equality, um, particularly in comparison with traditional technology, will be a huge issue in that regard. Do the other panelists have anything to add? Uh, Hugo, I see you unmuted yourself. If I may add uh, something to the last point stressed by Bernhard. Uh, uh, well, uh, current uh, uh, activism, 
of uh, EU lawmakers are making this uh, harmonization problem uh, even dramatic in some cases. Uh, just let me give you uh, the instance of uh, how the GDPR, which is the EU data protection regulation, the Artificial Intelligence uh, uh, Act, and the regulation on medical devices interact. Uh, well, it can be really tricky to determine uh, how this uh, triangle of legal sources uh, should be uh, understood. Um, and uh, not with the fact that, of course, uh, every proposal of the co uh, Commission, European Commission, includes uh, specific rules uh, on uh, uh, legal harmonization. But the problem remains. On the other hand, uh, concerning draw, uh, drawbox uh, of uh, strict liability policies, of course, the main problem remains uh, that which uh, Simon stressed before. Uh, that is, uh, if you use uh, strict liability as uh, the one size fits all strategy, uh, well, the main drawback uh, has to do with uh, uh, the risk of hindering uh, technological uh, innovation. And so we are back to the dilemma of uh, cognitive. That's it. Yeah, maybe, maybe just um, following on from that, the um, I mean, one, one likely scenario is, uh, and this is back to Bernard's slide, essentially, it is a very interesting diagram that what we will see most likely just in cars uh, is uh, something that's already been happening. I mean, in many jurisdictions, um, drivers, I mean, if I crash into Ugo, and injure him because I'm driving badly, he or his estate can sue me. If I injure him because my car blows up, no, not much use suing me, but you can probably go after the manufacturer and all we'll see is a kind of shift. Uh, and I think this is the problem with the idea of AI regulation. And, and this is partly the response to the AI draft regulation from the EU is how do you define its boundaries? This is the point Bernard was making, because if, you, if you're under-inclusive, uh, then you establish unfairness. If you're over-inclusive, Hugo's point is that you'll unnecessarily constrain innovation. Um, and so, I mean, maybe for the benefit of the audience, we did actually get together before this panel uh, and say, we're not going to define AI too narrowly uh, because we want to have a broad discussion. But that really does raise the question that it leads to an interesting discussion, but terrible regulation because you've got very fuzzy edges uh, and you have the kind of um, in intersectional challenges that Hugo is pointing to. Uh, although I do want to congratulate ourselves on getting uh, to an hour in the panel and no one's mentioned a trolley problem yet. So I think we all get a, a, a bonus for that. The panel was very carefully selected, doubtless, you know, to avoid endless discussions of the trolley car problem. Now, there are a couple of questions that are quite related to this. Uh, so, so Alec Nicholson raises the question about whether we should actually be expanding the scope of liability, focusing specifically on autonomous vehicles on the basis that designers of autonomous vehicles have a greater ability to insure out than, say, an ordinary driver would, uh, and that it's lost spreading is easier when you can spread it organically across the supply chain. Both from a policy, pragmatic and strictly legal point of view, would the panel think that would be a good idea? Well, very briefly, yes. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what happened with product liability through the 20th century, that we, have, we went from caveat emptor, or buyer beware, to an argument that was gradually accepted around the world that given the complex manufacturing processes, putting responsibility on the producer made sense. So I, I'm, uh, I like that argument, but I also um, pick up on Philip Morgan's um, observation. Yes, I think uh, like mandatory insurance might be one way of, of addressing some of the potential impact on uh, a constraint of innovation. If I, uh, if I may, on this very point, huh? it's very telling what's What's going on in the civil aviation law in, uh, in Europe? Uh, we have a, a federal regulation uh, for the use of drones. And uh, well, uh, we have a compulsory insurance for, uh, of course, not all uses of uh, uh, drones, but uh, for the most critical uses of. Uh, uh, of these uh, systems. So uh, there is a specific field of uh, technological innovation, uh, namely unmanned 
aircraft systems, uh, uh, which uh, clarifies uh, how these uh, uh, work on uh, insurance, not, not with uh, notwithstanding the lack of data, because the other problem we have here, uh, okay, good with the insurance, uh, but how about the lack of data we have most of the time concerning probability of events, consequences, and costs of uh, these uh, technologies. But uh, since uh, uh, the very idea is to have a unified sky in Europe for both manned and unmanned uh, uh, aircraft vehicles uh, next year. Uh, well, if you are interested about how these insurance policies are being adopted in Europe, I, uh, I think civil aviation law is uh, uh, a good uh, legal test for this kind of discussion. Or Professor Cook, did you want to add anything to that? Well, uh, I mean, the question of, of uh, holding the car manufacturers liable is, of course, one thing that uh, in this particular scenario uh, obviously makes sense to some extent. Um, and we discussed that also in the expert group, obviously. Um, this, to some extent, depends on the effectiveness of a recourse system. If you stay with the keeper's liability regime, then you have to make sure that there is a uh, sufficient way uh, and effective ways to get recourse from the manufacturers. And then, of course, then the follow-up question is, why do we need a second step? And why not go straight to the producers, obviously? Um, the overlapping issue here is whether we will still have car ownership as such in the future, or whether car producers will at the same time be uh, those basically selling time with the cars rather than selling the cars themselves. Um, and then, of course, the keeper uh, moves to back to the manufacturer in the first place. So there are a couple of issues here. Uh, um, the, the other problem there is obviously um, how do you design car manufacturer liability in the future? Um, obviously, you will have to, to couple that with insurance. Um, that per se is not an issue. But as Ugo just said, one of the big problems here is, is the question of lack of data for the time being. Um, obviously, car manufacturers at the moment are desperately trying to collect data. And as you know, there are debates about uh, the um, uh, accessibility of data because each manufacturer obviously tries to stick to its own collected data um, and things like that. So these are just some of the issues that, that will need to be considered. But the biggest problem in the long run or in the, in the medium run, let's put it this way, will be the coexistence of traditional vehicles and autonomous vehicles on the, on the streets in the future. Um, and if you, for example, foresee strict liability of the car manufacturers only for autonomous vehicles, that will obviously again trigger the question of equality. Uh, why have a, a distinct system for that and not for the rest of the cars? Um, and then they, those car producers of traditional vehicles will then say, well, we don't do anything wrong. Uh, according to statistics, um, the um, uh, number one uh, reason for car traffic accidents, uh, and this is just to confirm what Simon said, uh, in Germany, 93% of all car accidents are caused by human fault. Um, and so why should car manufacturers be hold liable for that? Um, so there are a couple of issues. Um, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea, but there are a couple of issues that need to be answered first. Uh, if I can pick up a point that's uh, emerged from Emmanuel and Philip's questions, it does product liability, whether the product liability directive or other regimes elsewhere in the world, does product liability provide a useful framework or a useful starting point for this area, or do we actually need a different approach? Oh, in other words, can we start with product liability as a framework and move from there, or do we just need to start with a different set of principles and thoughts? Well, uh, I see Ugo's microphone is on, but I'm not sure whether he wants to respond first. But um, uh, also answering another question that was raised in, in the Q&A uh, section, uh, which links to your statement just before, um, uh, there will be two different directive drafts um, published in this month still, on the 28th of September, most likely. Certainly the one that DG Justice will publish, and there will be two different directives, one reforming the productivity regime and the other one um, uh, catering specifically um, to AI liability risks. Um, and um, it's still not yet clear how the overlap will be resolved, obviously. Um, and 
to answer yet another question in the Q&A uh, regarding the proposal by European Parliament of October 2020 um, uh, that uh, had some interesting ideas, obviously, um, but um, I'm very skeptical of the uh, technical approach of a regulation, which Parliament obviously chose as the instrument uh, that they suggest. Um, so I'm, I'm more happy with the directive approach. Um, um, but the fundamental idea in that draft of 2020 to distinguish between high-risk uh, AI systems and others makes perfect sense to me. Um, the question then obviously is, um, what are high-risk uh, and other low-risk AI systems and where to draw the line? But um, generally speaking, I think there is no alternative to have those two categories. But yes, there will be a new product coverage directive uh, coming up, uh, which will define uh, digital products as products within the regime. That's for sure. Um, and there will be another directive draft out, as I said, on the 28th of September, which will deal with AI liability specifically. Uh, Ugo and Simon, did you want to add anything to that? I'm fine. Simon, a non-EU perspective? Well, I suppose, um, uh, again, we're, we're talking at a very high level of generality, but if you bring it down to a specific use case, then, I mean, yeah, if your Roomba blows up, it's a product you should be able to sue. Um, the problem is we're going to be depending on ever more AI systems, not all of which will have a physical manifestation. So if the Roomba blows up, much like if a car blows up, whether it blows up because the carburetor malfunctioned or the AI system malfunctioned, pretty clearly product liability will help. One issue though is going to be as we have more and more of our lives controlled by distributed systems, I mean, if uh, I'm trying to think of the best example, if there's some sort of um, error in your, automa in your AI enabled um, software that controls the heating in your house, it switches off while you're asleep, you go into a coma and die or something like that, or, if, if, if those systems can also be covered as products, then yes, product liability would be useful, um, but it gets more and more removed from our traditional notions of product. Although I think in most jurisdictions, well, certainly many jurisdictions, product at the moment is defined as some sort of physical object plus electricity uh, for legacy reasons. Uh, and so the inclusion of certain AI systems within that, or at least digital products does make sense. Um, although, uh, again, I'm kind of interested to see where the, where the limit is in terms of how product comes to be defined. I suppose uh, if, uh, I, if I can just pick, uh, quickly pick up another uh, question that's been raised in chat by Alex uh, Nicholson, he asks, and this it gets back to uncertainty in relation to defining concepts. If we have pervasive use of artificial intelligence software, but where the create it's not always easy to identify who the creators of that software are, or is it pretty good even say there are too many creators? You have the people who create the training data set, which the software uses. So I mean, you have a completely different person writing an algorithm, which may incorporate an off-the-shelf core of of which we have very many. What implications does this have for the discussion? Yeah, well, very quickly, just because I'm the first unmuted. Um, I, I think there are a couple of implications. Firstly, on the, on the creation aspect, I, I happened to meet yesterday with Ryan Abbott, who's been going around various jurisdictions, making the argument that an AI system should be recognized as an inventor for patent purposes. Uh, but uh, but this idea of AI creation, I mean, it's certainly true, although there are plenty of problems that tort law can't solve if you can't, I mean, if, if there's a hit on an accident, we don't know where the driver is. I mean, this is already a problem uh, that many jurisdictions face. Uh, the uh, And one way to address that is through compulsory insurance, uh, back to that, back to that idea. Um, but this is actually one argument where I, I think what we need is not just tortious liability won't be enough. Uh, and so, in Singapore, I think now four years ago, we five years ago, we introduced a law making an, an offence to interfere with an autonomous vehicle. Uh, again, back to the point that's already been made, that the dangers posed by autonomous vehicles are not so much autonomous vehicles as autonomous interactions with human-driven vehicles and human pedestrians. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there are there are problems to confront there. Uh, and then there are larger issues that something that that I've worked on, not really in the tortious space, but in the, the regulation of AI more generally, um, that I think uh, the idea of a general AI or a super intelligence that turns nasty, that remains science fiction for the moment. Um, but I think there are real reasons to be wary of the development of uncontrollable or uncontainable artificial intelligence. Um, and, and we've had historical examples of restriction on, for example, genetic engineering. If there's a danger that a, a genetic, um, genetically engineered um, mechanism, uh, organism went beyond controls, biological restriction, restrictions on biological weapons, chemical weapons, uh, nuclear research, uh, for example. I think there are areas in which we need to restrain technology for fear of it getting beyond our, our control. Uh, but um, yeah, so I think there are some reasons for concern there. But again, what is the problem we're trying to address? Uh, and if we're focusing on responsibility for identifiable action, that's one set of questions, as opposed to uh, the need to make to impose not just tortious responsibility, but in some cases, potentially criminal liability uh, in order to prevent certain devices being sent out to market in the first place. If I may, yes, please. Uh, going back to uh, Alex Nicholson's questions, uh, in particular on uh, AI creativity or AI as an inventor, uh, I think from a philosophical viewpoint, uh, what's creativity? Uh, I would have no problems to admit that we already have artificial creativity. Uh, either in aesthetic uh, terms, or for example, uh, consider uh, uh, in the case of chess or other board games, Go, uh, in which uh, the AI system uh, plays for the first time ever in the history of humanity, uh, a kind of strategy that no human ever uh, uh, saw. Uh, the point being that, uh, Although we may admit that our AI systems are excellent painters, uh, poets, uh, journalists, uh, and whatever, uh, no legal system would uh, admit uh, that they are the legal creator, blah, 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 for a simple reason, that is the anthropomorphic basis of all legal systems. So if you are not a human, sorry, uh, you cannot be a creator or an inventor in legal terms. Uh, but how about... Uh, uh, and of course, we already have the technology for an AI system designing and setting up another AI system so that third order technologies, no human in the loop. And so how about the case of an unknown uh, creator? Uh, well, how about the public domain in this case? Uh, the public domain, it's a very uh, tricky uh, concept because we can define it so far. In negative terms, we can determine what's in the public domain by excluding what is not protected by copyright law, patent law, and the like. But uh, sooner or later, uh, I think that technology will uh, oblige us to reconsider seriously. Uh, the uh, very notion of public domain uh, in light of Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. To me, it's uh, a tragedy that we are protecting uh, literary works uh, 70 years after the death uh, of the author. This is uh, uh, unacceptable, including my books and those of Simon, of course. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Hugo. My kids want, <laughs> my kids want those, those tens of dollars that come in. We'll keep my kids in sweets, maybe. Beth Marx, did you have anything to add to that? Um, well, um, one point that, that was raised earlier, um, the, the question of, of uh, unknown developers, um, and, and uh, Simon mentioned compulsory insurance, obviously then the question is obviously who pays the insurance if you don't know who is the developer um do you want the keeper uh, to be the one chipping in or who else uh, so that problem just moves to the insurance level i think 
Um, as long as we have a large scale system like uh, traffic, motor traffic, for example, that's a non-issue in practice because it's such an step. We have the established green card system in Europe. Um, it's a well-functioning system. As I said, the Council of Bureaus is not concerned at all about AI because they say, well, it's just a different technology, but the, the core problem remains the same and the way we handle things will remain the same as well. Um, and if we have large scale <clears throat> production of AI systems, again, on the motor vehicle level, um, there may be gentlemen's agreements between the major players. Uh, they may have an exchange of data and things like that. So uh, the real problem is in those cases where you have minuscule developers of AI, um, adding in open source elements, for example, we just had a, a webinar uh, last thing, week, I think it was, uh, at the European Law Institute, uh, and I just abused this uh, temporarily to shamelessly advertise uh, the European Law Institute's draft uh, of a reformed product ability directive, which was published uh, two weeks ago, uh, and I posted the link to that in the Q&A uh, as well. But this draft reform of the PLD was uh, circulated and, and presented in the webinar, as I said, and in that seminar, um, uh, one of the speakers um, alluded to that very problem. What about open source developers? You cannot, first of all, get a hold of them to begin with. And if you can, why should they be liable for large scale loss that they, they will probably not even be compensated for their contribution to the overall uh, system? So that will definitely be an issue that needs to be addressed at some sort. Um, Another thing that was mentioned uh, and, and in the same webinar, and again, there's a link to that, that you can watch it on YouTube, Amarilis Verhoeven from the European Commission, who's in charge of the uh, PLD portfolio, uh, did give some indications of into which direction the commission will go. Um, so um, uh, if you are interested in, in, in how this will develop, you can read between her lines, if you will, a little bit at least. Um, but another problem I would like to pick up is, is something that Simon mentioned in his talk. Um, and I'm, I'm happy, more than happy to uh, also come back to the trolley problem uh, for Simon's sake, um, because that's the question of regulation. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face as tort lawyers at the moment is that our role is, is challenged as such, because so far we were pathologists. We were looking at a corpse and try to identify the cause of death. But what developers now ask from us is the other way around. We should basically predict someone's life before that person was even conceived. Uh, and I remember in Brussels, we had discussions with multiple technology developers, including, as Ugo will recall, a guy who is in charge of developing uh, autonomous bus systems in both Singapore and Boston. And, and he kept asking us about the trolley problem. And he kept asking us, we need an answer for the trolley problem because we need to program the AI to take the right turn uh, on, the, on the tracks. And that's exactly the key problem that we're facing right now as thought lawyers. Because in the past, we could easily define the standard of care retrospectively. We already have the corpse before us and can tell by looking back at the exact facts what happened, this was wrong or this was right. But what we now are asked to do, uh, and this is your regulation theme that you rightfully alluded to, um, we are now being asked what would a potential hypothetical scenario look like in the future? And how would we potentially respond to that in the future? And that, of course, is a huge problem because we don't know what's going to happen. And the biggest, and one of the problems of that is that AI developers themselves advertise their systems as being safer than human conduct. Uh, and that is the key problem, one of the many problems. Um, because uh, as I think Simon said, uh, why should they be kept to a higher standard? Well, because they themselves advertise that they meet the higher standard. Um, and so these are issues that we are grappling with at the moment. Um, and and um, so it will be impossible to come up with a precise definition of how liability will look like in the future. It will have to be sort of loose to some extent. Um, and, and that, of course, triggers a question of predictability in the long run, but I'm afraid it will be difficult uh, unless we see sort of some experience generated over time, uh, it will be very difficult to, to come up with sort of a, a, a long lasting solution in tort law. Uh, on the point of it not being safer, I think the incidents we saw with Boeing and its approach to aircraft design recently instantiate that the whole point there was to have a computer controlled software system which would override mistakes made by the pilots. But of course, that is not exactly what happened. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think that that, that is actually from a regulator. And it was something no regulator could actually have foreseen that the 
interventions by what was supposed to be a safety system would cause other accidents that pilots could not prevent. So uh, yeah, I think that that recent experience really just instantiate that. Uh, Simon, did you have something you were going to add? I saw you unmuted your mic briefly. Uh, no, no, I was just going to say in terms of um, some, some of these questions will be resolved by case law, some by regulators and some by the market. And so my, my just the only thing I'll say about the trolley problem is that there was a, a major survey, uh, a, a major study that was published in Science some years back uh, that concluded in extreme situations, um, most people when surveyed, given the choice between the extreme case of should the vehicle kill six school children or drive off a cliff and sacrifice the driver, most people say, yes, yeah, sacrifice the driver. Follow up question, would you ever get in a car program this way? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, and so I think most, uh, most certainly most vehicle manufacturers are saying their number one priority will be driver safety. Uh, and the reality is, yes, stopping the car will be will be safest. Uh, but, um, and those limit, just, we get a lot of time spent on those limit cases uh, when uh, it's not clear that you actually need to program the vehicle in that way. Uh, to say, okay, count the number of people and then kill the fewest uh, when it's a very unlikely scenario in the first place. Yeah, that probably won't be a very popular, uh, I think it, it's the sort of thing you can see in the tabloid headlines, whipping up moral outrage over vehicles programmed to murder as murder large numbers of people. Absolutely. Uh, we have time left for one question and I'm torn as to whether to abuse chair's privilege or raise the one last question left in the chat. I think I am with reluctance going to be going to have to do the latter. Um, this question from Emmanuel and she asked to all speakers but specifically to Simon. Uh, going to I suppose the question that's at the heart of what we've been talking about, it can be really challenging to determine when to regulate in part because of the two sides of the question, the costs of regulation versus the misidentification of legal issues. Given where we are right now in our understanding of AI, is now really the right time for reform, total or regulation in the context of AI? Um, so, I mean, to me, I, I'm still not convinced that we need AI regulation as such. I think there are various use cases. I think the product liability question would be enormously helpful. Um, and apart from that, yeah, I would be focusing on the specific use cases because, uh, again, we haven't belabored this point, but if you talk about regulating AI, what do we mean? Do we mean regulating machine learning? In which case you might as well say we're regulating statistics um, or regression analysis. Uh, what we're concerned about, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, and in some cases, it's we want technologies to be safe. So it's clear that autonomous vehicles are coming at some point, maybe not as quickly as many of us thought. I, I confess I was completely wrong. I have a, a teenage son who some years back, I thought they have to drive. Clearly that was wrong. So some things we do want to be safe, and this is the kind of debate we've been having, and that's where tort law can play a role. Um, in other areas, so I, I talked about lethal autonomous weapons. I think we could have uh, real-time biometric surveillance, whether some, things, some technologies should be prohibited. But that's a specific application. That's not AI as such. Uh, and so, yeah, my answer to the question would be, yes, we absolutely need to regulate some applications of AI, uh, but it's not really meaningful, I think, to regulate AI as such. I, I can only agree. Uh, sorry, Uko, if you want to go first. No, 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 no please, Bernard. Sorry, I didn't see your microphone. Uh, well, I, I can only agree, um, and, and as Ugo will also be able to confirm shortly, um, in the expert group, we had serious problems to identify use cases for our debate, because we kept coming back to autonomous cars, which is a completely unique standalone problem uh, in very peculiar circumstances, as has been mentioned during this debate altogether. Um, and also for my own presentation, I had no choice but to use autonomous vehicles, because that's the only practical uh, topic at the moment. I mean, you can talk about drones and stuff. Um, and for example, the draft uh, by the European Parliament, the, the uh, regulation that they proposed in October 2020, in the original draft of that draft uh, of April 2020, uh, the reporter added an annex uh, identifying uh, potential high-risk AI systems. And one of the, the, the samples that he gave was um, autonomous cleaning systems. 
Um, and that was actually an internal joke in the expert group because we kept saying, well, what about a, a window cleaner that autonomously climbs up the walls of a glass building and then drops down onto the, onto the street and hits a pedestrian? But that was actually more of a running joke internally rather than a serious example, but it ended up in the draft of, of the European Parliament. Um, so uh, you can see that we are currently struggling with potential real life examples because even the autonomous vehicles are not yet ready on the roads. Um, and, and I fully agree with what Simon said, but uh, because of political pressure, um, inter area exerted by parliament in 2020 at the latest and also already in 2017 actually, um, the commission is driven to respond to that. They have political pressure to come up with something. Um, and uh, that's the question whether the time is right for regulation is, is not for them because they are pressured politically to come up with something uh, and I don't envy them actually. And uh, if I may, back to the question, how to govern and regulate AI, uh, please don't forget that we are not only dealing with how to tackle misuses uh, and overuses. Uh, there's uh, the additional problem of uh, AI underuse. I'm not inventing it. Have a look at the uh, principles of artificial intelligence by the G20 in Tokyo 2019. Uh, just to give you an example, not using technology for the wrong reasons is uh, costs. Technically, we talk about opportunity costs. And I have uh, uh, quantified the opportunity costs for the underuse of AI in the health sector in Italy, which spends around 9% of its GDP for the uh, health national uh, care system. Uh, well, not using AI uh, costs around one up to 2% of the Italian GDP. That is, in many cases, the underuse of AI is, so to speak, more expensive than uh, overuses and misuses of uh, the technology. And uh, we should be attentive to how uh, all lawmakers aim uh, to govern this further challenge of technology from the United States uh, to uh, Europe, uh, even to uh, Singapore, uh, which is a brilliant case study of how they are governing the transition from labs to, in this case, hospitals uh, of an AI system. But this is another a uh, crucial point that, that we shouldn't uh, forget. Thank you. And that is a very good note on which to end. Could I ask everyone to thank our speakers in the customary way? Uh, I think we've all learned a lot today and there's a lot of food for thought uh, going on. Uh, if I could now hand over to Sophie to wrap up the session. Thank you very much, Alvin, and I must now bring very regrettably this webinar to a close. So I would like to thank our chair, all our panelists for a lively, absolutely fascinating discussion and for highlighting with great precision and great clarity the range of problems that tort lawyers need to solve when they address uh, the regulation of applications of AI systems. So thank you very much. I want to thank all participants for their excellent questions, particular thanks to Emmanuel Lemaire for masterminding this project. And the recorded version of our discussion will be available in the next few weeks online. Um, a final word about BACL, we act as a point of contact for comparative lawyers in different countries. So please do be in touch if you would like to collaborate and or are interested in writing or publish on our website. And for now, Thank you very much, and I hope that you will join us again when we have um, our next webinar or seminar. We wish we would like to have our next webinar in uh, hybrid or at least in person um, in Oxford in June 2023. Um, thank you very much indeed, and have a good day and good afternoon. Thank you.